Hello everyone and welcome to this Berlin Buzzwords 2020 talk on scaling up deep learning by scaling down. I'm Nick Pentreath, I'm ML Nick on Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn. I'm a principal engineer working at IBM Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, Code A, where I work on machine learning and AI open source software. I'm an Apache Spark Committee and PMC member and author of Machine Learning with Spark. Before we begin, a little bit about Code A or the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. We're a team of over 30 open source developers within IBM, and we work on contributing to and advocating for open source projects that are foundational to IBM's data and AI product offerings. This includes the Python data science stack. Apache Spark is a core component of this stack. Open exchanges for data and deep learning models, deep learning frameworks, including TensorFlow and PyTorch, Kubeflow, AI fairness and ethics, as well as open standards for model deployment. Today we'll start with a deep learning overview and discuss the computational challenges involved with training and deploying deep learning models. We'll then look at three broad classes of approach for dealing with these challenges, including model architectures, model compression techniques, and model distillation. And then we'll wrap up with a conclusion. We'll start with the basic machine learning workflow. We start with data. We analyze that data, and we typically want to train a machine learning model using that data. Now, our data typically doesn't arrive in a nicely packaged format ready for machine learning. It arrives in a raw format, and we need to convert it, pre-process it, and do feature transformation and extraction to get it into a form amenable to machine learning, typically feature vectors and um, tensors. We then train a machine learning model, deploy it to a live environment, where it predicts uh, on new data coming in. Uh, and new data comes into the process, really turning this workflow into a loop. Now, as part of this workflow, the three main areas that are compute intensive are processing data, in particular training models and model deployment. Deep learning is a branch of machine learning that has been around for quite a number of years. The original theory dates back to the 1940s and some of the computer models originated around the middle of the 1960s. And on the right here, we can see a, an old perceptron machine, a neural network from the 1960s. Neural networks fell out of favor during the 80s and 90s, in part because of a lack of real world success in, in applications, and partly because of the, of the inability to actually compute and train these models. They've seen a recent resurgence due to three factors. The first being bigger and better and more open data sets as mobile phones, edge devices, and internet scale data collection have really proliferated, as well as standardized data sets for competition, such as ImageNet. Combined with this, we've seen better hardware, GPUs, and now custom hardware focused on deep learning applications, such as tensor processing units, TPUs. And the third leg is improvements to the algorithms, architectures, and optimization techniques on the software side. And these combined have led to new state-of-the-art results across computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing, language translation, and many more. Modern neural networks are really called deep learning because they are uh, neural networks made of multiple layers. And in computer vision, convolutional neural networks are a core building block for state-of-the-art models. And they've been used in image classification, object detection, segmentation, and many other applications. For sequences and time series, uh, applications such as machine translation, text generation, recurrent neural nets have been extremely uh, successful. And in other natural language processing applications, word embeddings, transformers, and attention mechanisms have seen success. And finally, modern deep learning frameworks provide computation graph abstraction, automatic differentiation, hardware acceleration support, and high levels of flexibility, allowing practitioners and researchers to create state-of-the-art models in a much easier fashion than previously instead of handcrafting solutions. In the previous era of AI and deep learning applications, the compute required roughly followed a two-year doubling time of Moore's law. But in the modern era, as we've seen an explosion in very complex and large solutions, that doubling time is something like three to four months. And this really highlights that we need software-based solutions, and we cannot just simply rely on improved hardware to really solve these problems. 
So we'll use an example today uh, throughout, and that is image classification, which is a very common deep learning uh, computer vision task. We start with an input image. We send that through our large neural network for inference, and we get a prediction for the class out. A very common uh, and highly performant modern deep learning neural network for image classification is called Inception V3. And we can see here that the core model is made up of these convolutional blocks, typically a convolution operator followed by normalization and then an activation function, often rectified linear unit or something like that. And we can actually boil this computation down to effectively a set of matrix multiply and addition operations. And if we look at the entire network, we can see we have many, many of these uh, blocks that are sitting in the network and that if we count up all the parameters this inception model has 24 million parameters and achieves a 78.8 percent accuracy on ImageNet. So if we look at the accuracy versus computational complexity of various networks the early models tended to have quite a lot of parameters not so much uh, operations and achieve moderate performance. We then moved into a new phase which was increasing the number of parameters and operational uh, computational complexity of these models in order to move up the accuracy curve. And then the next phase was starting to have more and more efficient network architectures. So trying to achieve high accuracy with relatively fewer computations. And another way of looking at this is to look at the information density or level of computational efficiency in each of these networks. And we can see that the models that achieve a relatively high accuracy for a relatively low number of operations are clearly the most efficient. They have a relatively high density or accuracy percentage per parameter effectively. But in absolute terms, these are still quite low numbers, uh, maxing out just below 12%. So this is really telling us that these large uh, networks are in fact over-parameterized and not very efficient in terms of their representation. When we think about deep learning deployment, typically on the model training side, we use substantial hardware, uh, typically GPU or multi-GPU or clusters of GPU uh, or other custom hardware or specific hardware like TPUs. And we can throw a lot of compute, uh, obviously at a cost, at this training. And when it comes to cloud-based deployment scenarios or on-premise deployment scenarios, we can use similar hardware to deploy models. And we can then trade off cost versus performance. If we want to use more GPUs, we can just throw some more, uh, potentially some more money at the problem. But when it comes to deploying into edge devices, we, we cannot just simply do that. Uh, edge devices are very diverse and have far more limited resources in general than available on cloud or on-premise hardware. They have limited memory and that memory is not all available to our application. We typically have to compete with other applications on the device. Similarly with compute, there may be limited computes. There may be some fairly powerful uh, mobile GPUs or edge GPUs, but we still are needing to compete with other applications in terms of uh, the computational resource. And finally, network bandwidth can be extremely limited and variable. So we cannot just deploy large, powerful models in order to get accuracy in these scenarios. We need to be cognizant of memory footprint we need to be cognizant of the compute efficiency and the latency involved and the latency requirements from our users um, and in fact getting the model onto the device can be a problem due to bandwidth so many of these considerations also apply to low latency applications such as uh, high frequency trading financial uh, applications programmatic trading and advertising where we have to make decisions in, in very much uh, real time and that could be low single digit milliseconds, even microsecond latency requirements. So again, we can't just have a huge model that takes a long time to compute, even if it's highly accurate. So how do we improve the performance efficiency in order to meet these requirements? We'll, we'll discuss uh, four approaches today. The first is just improving architectures. The second is, and third are comp uh, compression techniques for models, model pruning and quantization. And the final one is model distillation. 
the first thing we can do is potentially try to make networks more efficient in the way that they are designed. And indeed, this has been a key focus of research recently. So if we look at the basic inception model on the left, we can see that, as we saw, the standard convolutional building block is, is what makes up this model. And on the right, we have MobileNet version 1, which is one of the more famous recent specialized architectures targeting edge devices and other low resource environments. And the key difference here is that the building block is no longer a standard convolutional block, but instead a depth-wise convolutional building block. So this is effectively splitting the convolutional operator into a depth-wise convolution followed by another convolution. And this is, leads to about eight times less computation taking place with giving up a little bit of accuracy. So if we saw that the image uh, inception model had 24 million parameters with a 78.8% accuracy, then the mobile net model has over 80% fewer parameters and we give up about 8% accuracy. Another key advance in, in this area of research is to set up the core backbone of the network in such a way that it can be scaled. So this allows us to scale uh, mobile net, for example, to be thinner or wider. So we, we can scale the number of parameters uh, at each layer, and we can also scale the resolution of the input image representation. And this allows us to target the environment that we want to. So if we have a an environment with plenty of compute available, we can scale that up and get more accuracy. If we have a much more resource constrained environment, we can scale it down and give up accuracy, but still be able to run in that environment. So this idea was uh, taken through to MobileNet v2, which is an improvement. It uses the same depth-wise convolutional backbone, but adds some, uh, some further algorithmic and network tricks, linear bottlenecks and shortcut connections. And effectively, we're just trying to move up the curve here more, more to the upper left uh, part of this, this chart. Um, and again, we can scale to, um, to higher latency and higher accuracy or lower latency and lower accuracy, depending on the environment that we're in and the requirements of the application. So MobileNet v2 gives us a roughly the same number of parameters for an extra couple of percent accuracy, uh, of course, measured on standard benchmark data set of ImageNet. So you can see here that these uh, model classes are trying to achieve a much higher efficiency. So they may not be the best performers, but they are very strong performers with very low parameters, uh, number of parameters and computational overhead. And indeed, we can see that the class of mobile nets, as well as other efficient backbone-based architectures such as Shuffle and SqueezeNet, are much more efficient in terms of the information density within the parameters. Still, these numbers are around the uh, 20 to 50 percent mark, so there's clearly still work that can be done. Another recent advance, which has become uh, more and more popular, is the use of neural architecture search to find these backbone models. So the idea here is to effectively let uh, deep learning do some of the work um, and to search the space of available uh, network architectures in order to find the, the, the best backbone architecture that can then be scaled up and down. And this is done by optimizing both for accuracy as well as efficiency in the, term of, in the form of floating point operations. EfficientNet is one recent example of this, and we can effectively uh, outperform previous models um, and scale it from the B0 model, which uh, has a few more parameters than a mobile net, for example, but achieves about 5% more accuracy. And we can scale that up all, all the way through to the B7, uh, which is effectively still the same architecture, just much bigger and, uh, and deeper. And that goes up to 60 million parameters and gives us a boost of up to 84.5% accuracy. The same idea has been applied to the mobile net architecture, for example. So again, applying a neural architecture search uh, paradigm that is hardware aware, so uh, targeting both the performance and the efficiency. And here we can get a, a network with about 5 million parameters um, and sort of three, roughly 3% 3 increase in accuracy versus the old mobile nets. Now, a key challenge with neural architecture search is that it requires a huge amount of computational resources in order to find the best architecture and, in fact, to train each uh, different arch architecture or sub-architecture. Uh, now, 
This is also the case for manual design. If you're trying to manually design these networks and these backbone networks, there's a lot of uh, effort involved, a lot of testing, a lot of training, um, and a lot of experimentation. So the, the, the question asked by some researchers at MIT and the IBM MIT Data Lab is, can we train one network to do all of this for us? And this is the idea behind once for all. Train one network and specialize it for efficient deployment. So the idea is to train one large network once and then be able to effectively cherry pick out the subnetwork uh, targeting a specific environment um, or edge device or operating system or hardware accelerator, for example. And in this way, uh, we have a much more efficient mechanism for achieving the same result and still being able to uh, target e each one of these environments and trading off the efficiency uh, versus uh, and the computational considerations versus the, the accuracy, but still achieve state-of-the-art results. So the second approach, a uh, general approach that we'll look at is uh, that of trying to compress the model. We've seen effectively that many of these models and especially the large uh, networks are effectively over-parameterized. Uh, a lot of the weights in there are maybe not that important. So we have to ask the question, can we perhaps take some of these weights out of the model but still have the model perform pretty well? And this is the idea behind model pruning. The idea is to reduce the number of model parameters by removing the ones that are not important. In fact, in other words, the ones that are, have a small impact on prediction. So this is very similar to the idea of regularization with the L1 norm. We want to shrink down small weights that have little impact on, on the prediction and set them to zero. If we can set uh, weights to zero, then we can effectively ignore them. We can ignore them when we save the model. So that gives us a much smaller size on disk and across the wire for uh, sending the model back and forth. So we compress it in that form. And it can also give us lower latency if we can do the compute in a sparsity aware manner. So there are two broad types of pruning. The first is one-shot pruning, which is effectively do, uh, doing this process post-training. So you, you run through the network once and you prune the weights. And hopefully at the end, you get a more efficient model that can still perform uh, reasonably well. And the second is iterative pruning. And the idea here is to prune and then retrain. And this follows a schedule uh, and an iterative approach. So step one is to do the pruning, drop the least important weights, and then retrain. And then go through and drop the, the, the least important weights and retrain and so on and so on. And the idea would be to target a specific sparsity that you want to achieve or uh, computational budget uh, that you want to be able to fit into and stop the pruning when either of those or, or when one of those conditions is met. Now, what's quite interesting is that we can actually achieve quite a high level of sparsity via model pruning without giving up much. So this is for uh, ImageNet-based image classification models from the TensorFlow model optimization li uh, library docs. And as we can see here in an in Inception model, in fact, both for Inception and MobileNet, we can achieve a 50% sparsity by, uh, while giving up a very, very small amount of accuracy. So that really is showing us that these models are over-parameterized and there's, there's a lot of effectively superfluous information in their superfluous weights. Now, if we want to, to further trade off accuracy and get a much smaller model, then we can um, make models more and more sparse, do more and more pruning, and move down this curve to the right, getting a smaller model, but at that point starting to give up accuracy. And this doesn't just work for image classification. Here's an example from language translation. As you can see here, we can in fact achieve a very high level of sparsity while in fact get, getting a very small gain in our model performance. And thereafter, again, we're trading off performance for, for model size. So this is indicating that uh, model pruning is playing almost a regularization role. And again, these large models uh, for natural language processing tasks are also very much over-parameterized. The next model compression technique we'll discuss is called quantization. The idea behind quantization is that most deep learning computation uses 32-bit or even 64-bit floating point numbers. 
And quantization reduces the numerical precision of the weights and the operat operations on that weight by binning values. So if we start with a 32-bit uh, floating point uh, representation, we want to effectively turn that into a much sparser representation that takes up a lot less size. And if we can go down from 32 bits to, say, 16 bits, we're making a, an effectively two times a saving on the size. So the idea of behind binning is that if we look at a distribution of the, the weight values, we can effectively try and uh, approximate those weight values by a much smaller number of bins. Now, the main complexity here is uh, in dealing with overflow. So as we turn the computation and the, the weight representation to smaller uh, precision representations, in particular when accumulating things like gradients uh, during training, these can be very, very small numbers and small updates. So we risk overflowing the representation. So the, the, the key solution here is to use some sort of intermediate uh, representation for storage of things such as gradient updates and accumulations. So we can use a, a larger size, for example, 32-bit integer or something like that uh, during that process and then requantize it at the end to 8 bits or throw it away if we don't need it, uh, for example, after training. The so popular targets for quantization are 16-bit floating point and 8-bit integer coding. There are two types of quantization. You can do this post-training, very much similar to model pruning, where you take a pre-trained model and you just apply the quantization for effectively for inference only. Uh, so this is useful if you uh, can't retrain the model for whatever reason, or if it's not computationally feasible perhaps to retrain the model, seeing as it's a, you know, a very large uh, models, model and very complex and, and expensive to train. So in this case, you typically would give up accuracy, and most of the targets are typically going to be float uh, 16, 16-bit 16 floating point, a dynamic range quantization, or 8-bit integer. The second approach is to do it in a training-aware manner. So this is much more complex, and uh, for example, as we mentioned, you have to deal with overflows, uh, potential overflows, but this can really provide the, a huge efficiency gain with effectively minimal or close to zero loss in accuracy. So here on the right, we see an example of this for image classification models, again, from the TensorFlow model optimization uh, documentation. And for the inception model, we can see that, in fact, both post-training and training-aware quantization give a pretty similar uh, accuracy degradation, whereas for MobileNet, the post-training quantization results in a much larger degradation in accuracy. But if we do training-aware quantization, we give up very little. So this again is showing us that very large models, very complex models like Conception, are effectively somewhat over-parameterized. They've got a lot of superfluous information in there. Because if we are reducing the precision and effectively increasing the level of approximation in the weights and the operations, um, it's actually not having much impact. For a much more efficient and sort of leaner model like a mobile net, uh, they are much more informationally dense. So adding a further levels of approximation effectively uh, into the weights and operations is going to have more impact. We can see here the impact on latency and model size. So in some cases, uh, post-training quantization might, even, might in fact increase latency, as we see here for MobileNet. Um, but in, in both cases, we get a significant 75% reduction in model size. Um, and for very large models, typically, you'll get uh, a decrease in latency. For training aware, again, uh, we get a very large efficiency gains and for, very, for giving up very little in terms of accuracy. So quantization used to be a very tricky thing to do, uh, involving very large amounts of custom code, uh, but now it's much, much easier. It's baked into TensorFlow and PyTorch itself, uh, with, and as well as third-party toolkits of, such as Distiller for PyTorch. Uh, and it's much, much easier to use, and you can just run the optimization code on your model or train using training aware quantization. The final technique we'll discuss briefly is called model distillation. Um, and as we've seen, large models may be quite overparameterized and relatively inefficient in their representations. So the idea here is can we take such a large complex model and use it as a teacher to, 
to effectively teach a smaller, simpler student model. So we want to distill down the core knowledge of that large model or potentially large set of models in, a, in an ensemble and see if we can represent that knowledge via a much simpler student model. So we see here a representation of this where we have a teacher model typically with a lot more layers um, or more complexity or depth than a student model. And we want to transfer that knowledge to the student model. So we're training the student model on the teacher model's predictions. There are a number of tricks uh, involved here, but effectively what we see at the bottom right is um, results from the original Jeff Hinton paper on model distillation. And we can see that a distilled single model can actually outperform the baseline uh, model and, uh, and architecture uh, used and gets very close to the 10 times ensemble, uh, which is actually used as the teacher model. Model distillation is lesser used uh, in image classification uh, these days, I mean, certainly around, but, but probably less uh, popular. Uh, but it's been quite successful in natural language, natural language processing, in particular for recent transformer-based models such as BERT, uh, some distilled models such as DistilBERT and TinyBERT, for example, have achieved very, very small model sizes and much more efficient models uh, for in either giving up very little in terms of accuracy or in some cases even outperforming some of the, some of the previous state-of-the-art larger BERT models. So again, this is really indicating that there's a lot of inefficiency in the model architectures and these large image classification models as well as these large language models are really over-parameterizing um, and there's a lot more that can be done to improve these architectures and that'll be definitely something uh, of a focus for research going forward. So we've seen that uh, this space is rapidly evolving. It's an area of very very, very rapid development in research and new efficient model architectures are always being released, uh, especially for targeting edge devices and um, low resource deployment targets. So if one fits your need, if you are doing image-based uh, models, uh, computer vision, and there's one available that's pre-trained, great, you can use that. In many cases, your particular use case may not actually fit well with something that is out there and, uh, and been made pu public and released. So in that case, you can look at these compression techniques, pruning and quantization, and as we've seen, they can yield very large efficiency gains and without giving up necessarily too much in terms of accuracy. But you typically can, you have a lot of tweaks and tools and knobs that you can turn to trade off how much accuracy you're willing to give up. Uh, versus your computation budget and, and your the computation resources of your target. It's very easy to do this with a very strong built-in support in the deep learning frameworks these days. One could even look at uh, combining pruning and quantization, but this is obviously a lot trickier. Which do you do first? Probably you prune and then quantize and so on. Um, this is It's not clear exactly the best way to go about doing this, so that'll be an area of, uh, of much more kind of experimentation to figure out what works well. Model distillation is a, generally less popular. It's a lot more complex to do um, and it does require training um, and training effectively uh, more models. So again, more computationally intensive at training time, but it can be very, you know, potentially very compelling for natural language processing tasks, especially where there's an existing model that's been released uh, like a distal bird. Thank you very much for joining me today. I encourage you to check out uh, coday.org, uh, which lists all the open source projects within the data and AI space that we work on uh, at Coday. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub at MLNIC. Um, and I also encourage you to check out the Model Asset Exchange, which is a free and open exchange for deep learning models, state-of-the-art models, where we have a number of uh, different image classification models as examples. And you can try out uh, both the large architectures and the small um, mobile and edge device focused architectures, for example, for image classification and segmentation. I've also uh, left a set of references in the slides uh, for some of the topics that we've discussed today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again for the talk. Um, that was a bit again, of technical difficulties. So there is one question that a uh, person asking on Slack. Um, why do you think is uh, pruning and quantization is tricky? 
Uh, yet, yeah, so firstly, thanks to everyone for, for listening and uh, your questions. Um, pruning and quantization is a, a bit tricky to do um, together just because it's, it's kind of not clear what is the principled approach to take. Um, so typically, you know, so for example, if you um, do, do you do uh, pruning first and then quantize or quantizing and then pruning? So if you quantize the, the, all the weights, um, the pruning mechanism may not work quite as you expect and you, you may get you know, an end result which is degrading too much um, accuracy. Um, and, and, but, but I think that if you do it the other way around, it's gonna be probably a little bit better. In other words, sparsify the model first and then once you're happy with that, you can quantize and, and, uh, and get, get the, uh, the slightly you know, uh, compressed model without losing too much performance. But either way, it, it's, it's not a, um, th there's no um, kind of good formula for saying exactly how you should do it. Um, both of them would probably work. There's a couple of papers um, out there where they actually use all of these techniques together. So uh, quantization, pruning, um, but coming up with a, a kind of uh, scheme for doing it is is not uh, is, there's no kind of accepted one one way to do it i guess cool awesome um there was another question from nicola uh are there like any good implementation of nas and as all capital uh sure so i mean neural architecture search is generally um kind of auto auto ml or auto ai for deep learning uh, there's there's a lot of stuff out there um, I haven't I've put I haven't put any any direct links to that in, in the presentation, but um, in most of the the main uh, kind of research labs, um, I mean IBM Research included, uh, Google, you know Facebook, and everyone um, have have it's got quite a lot of stuff around the way that they do neural architecture search. Um, you know Google has published some of the details about how they generate things like the efficient nets and the mobile nets. V3 and so on. So those are all actually published papers. And, and if you go, if you follow the links um, in in the presentation, which, which I think will be posted uh, for for the Google blog post, for example, for efficient net mobile net, they all they have links to the papers there that have um, in turn uh, details about how they do the architecture search. Um, similarly, I, I actually posted the the once for all model in the Slack channel, and in that GitHub repo at the bottom, actually, uh, you'll find a bunch of related work, which includes uh, auto ML for architecting efficient and specialized neural networks, um, and auto ML for model compression and acceleration on mobile devices, uh, architecture search on target task and hardware. So there's a few, um, there's, a, there's a bit of detail there about uh, some of the specifically um, hardware when, uh, you know, your architecture search. And then finally, the, the cloud providers, again, including IBM, Google, um, AWS, and everybody have their own versions of auto AI and kind of uh, neural architecture search as part of their, their cloud machine learning platforms. Cool, awesome. And I guess more in general, also neural architecture search is also like slightly different direction, right? Because I mean, the distillation would be like very similar once you already have model and trying to scale it up. Otherwise, you're just like trying to solve problem in general, right? So slightly in different direction. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, awesome. Um, I guess uh, people are typing. So let's see if they're gonna be fast enough to type the question. Um, do you like use it also like in production for your, I don't know, your own projects? So it's like mostly like research and, uh, you know, investigation, like what is possible? What is the usual like life cycle of you uh, starting with a model and uh, after bringing it to like distilled version and uh, more inference, how, how long it takes for you usually? Uh, I mean, most of the, the work that we do uh, in our group is, is related, related to open source projects. So one of the, um, one of the projects that we work on that I mentioned is the model asset exchange uh, within our, our group, which is a free and open source resource for deep learning models. And um, for some of the image models, we are working with, uh, so all, all those models are, are completely free and we typically re you know, take, take the state of the art model for object detection or 
you know, image segmentation or name density recognition, whatever the case may be. And we package it up in a Docker container, exposing a standardized REST API, and that's all kind of mm -hmm. completely free and open. Um, we work with a few internal groups uh, who sometimes approach us looking for open source solutions for their customers, for example. Um, and one such group has been the, the uh, working on edge device deployment, so like ARM architectures and uh, and similar. So there, you know, you, you have this this problem where you, you your default model might be the large you know, very accurate model for um, for image classification, but but they want a you know a highly targeted mobile net model. So we allow them to kind of just plug different models into the Docker container when they build it for different architectures. Mm -hmm. As of yet, we haven't directly applied the quantization side, but um, if they you know if for example in this particular use case it turns out that they need a lot more efficiency, they may come back to us and say, can we actually you know train a custom model with quantization? Yeah. And then we'll provide a kind of advisory capacity. So most of this is um, is you know, it was some of it's applied in, mostly in 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 selecting the different uh, architectures and the, you know, the, the best mm -hmm. kind of uh, target uh, model for each target platform. Uh, for quantization and model pruning, it's you know, it's mostly what's available in the in the deep learning libraries and, and that, mm -hmm. but we, we're not using it directly in our projects at the moment. Okay, awesome. So another, maybe one of the last questions from Peter, uh, what kind of metrics are you looking during the model optimization while scaling down besides size, accuracy, and required operations, right? Because uh, I guess if I extend this question, um, you can do pruning, right? But it only works like if you're, um, you know, like edge device or whatever, like a CPU supporting like sparse operations, right? So like, do you also sometimes like looking more what is a, a specific, uh, you know, executor going to be running that, or are there like any technique actually to get it closer? And what other metrics are helpful for that? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, you do need to be aware of what your what the capabilities of your execution environment are on the software side. So yeah, you're at the. You know, there's no point in pruning if you can't take advantage of the sparsity. Um, so most of the time, you're going to be targeting, uh, you know, something like TF Lite or, or uh, mm -hmm. you know, or, or something. Uh, so it depends on you know, if, if you're going to an edge device or mobile device, and you and you work in TensorFlow. Obviously, it depends. Um, and similarly, you know, JavaScript. If you're looking at the, maybe maybe the browser or the mobile browser, tf.js or onyx.js or whatever you, you want to be using. Um, so that's a part of it. But I mean, generally, you'd you'd look at uh, not just size on disk for memory, but also um, memory. You know the, the the memory footprint of, of the running program, um, and that's often quite different, um, and and then sometimes a bit unexpected. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, um, you know, you might find that the the network on disk is, is is a certain size, but when but but it kind of explodes memory when you when you're loading. Typically, that's that's going to be some inefficiency or bug somewhere, and mm -hmm. we actually come across an issue like that in a project we're working on right now, where it's you got something. 20 megabit, megabytes on disk, but it explodes to well over gigabytes in memory. <laughs> so, you know, things like that obviously need to be checked. It's not enough to just say, oh, well, I've got a small serialized model, it must be good. Um, but apart from that, pretty much, yeah, size, accuracy, and, and, and yeah. flops or, or some other metric of uh, compute resources is pretty much what you'd look at. Um, federating learning setup. Uh, yeah, I mean that, that's a that's a good point. I mean, I I haven't worked directly on federated learning at this point, um, and that's mostly something where you know companies or organizations that are that are kind of have access to a network of of edge devices or you know user devices where there's there's user data and there's a cap uh, on the device and there's capacity for federated learning. We're not really working on stuff like that. Um, I think they, you know, effectively the, the considerations are similar. Um, you you have to then take into account not just training but inference, because mm. typically you want to do a gradient update on the on the mobile device and then send it back for federated learning. Um, the reality is. The the compute for for computing a gradient step versus uh, versus just inference is, is not that much extra of it. So, but you you would have to definitely take it into into account, um, as well as the fact that you don't have access necessarily to all of the CPU 
or, or GPU, you know, for, for doing that. So that, that's more of a challenge of, of uh, I don't think it's so, so much an architectural, uh, an, a, you know, a network architecture challenge as, as a, just the software challenge by saying, schedule the, the update for a, a down, you know, a time where the, the, the device is not busy. So. Yeah, yeah, that completely makes sense. Maybe last question for me is, you mentioned like memory footprint, right? And how things are kind of like exploding in memory. Um, and I've seen also some groups also working on the, having some ML specific like compiler, let's say Google with uh, MLAR, right? And, uh, you know, when you can fuse operations like while actually compiling that. Um, how do you feel about that, right? Do you think it's something that like in, I don't know, a couple of years is gonna be replacing all of those uh, model converters and like pruning and everything else? Or is this kind of, uh, yet like a bit uh, far-fetched and uh, we're not going to see first result for this one? Uh, yeah, interesting question. I mean, I, I think I think we're going to see a lot happening there. Um, yeah, the, the, with compilers, it's always, there's always going to be edge cases. Um, so I don't think it's ever going to be perfect, uh, but I think you can achieve a lot. And it's certainly very clear that there's already in, you know, if, if you just, just training an, a model in, in you know, TensorFlow and Keras and all the kind of, there's a lot of magic happening with graph construction and you end up, I think, with a lot of the time, something quite inefficient. So being able to, comp, you know, to, to run a kind of compiler type of you know, process over that, um, or at least even just doing pruning, not from a, from a weight perspective, but just from a graph operator perspective and doing post optimization um, is important. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think it's going to be a silver bullet, like it's going yeah. to not solve, solve every problem. But certainly, I think we, that's definitely going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of progress there. And I mean, if you look at you know, the, the new the new stuff coming out, like, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, the, you know, have you obviously got the XLA stuff and, um, and JAX. Yeah. 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 And all of these new, you know, New frameworks which are effectively trying to more and more move to intermediate representation forms yeah um yeah so i mean i think we will we will see that see that yeah awesome thank you again for your talk and uh, for awesome uh, answers for the questions um i guess we're going to continue like in breakout room and uh, for the live stream we are done thank you again see ya cool. thank you everyone <laughs>